Hey, Josh Felber here. Super excited for today's guest. 2023, we are rocking with some amazing content that's going to blow your mind. Uh, Today's guest grew up in the gangs, grew up school of hard knocks, and transformed himself into a multimillionaire as well as finding purpose in his life. And now he's helping entrepreneurs, business owners like us, like you, to be able to help figure that out as well as scale their companies to multi-million dollar companies. So check out today's episode with Ryan Blair. You are going to love it. I think that when you're spiritually inclined, a lot of people believe that money is mutually exclusive. And I think I'm here to tell you that by being spiritually focused, you can actually generate far more wealth because the money that you generate has a deeper meaning. And so you will call it in with more reverence. You will be a better steward of it, of it, a better caretaker of it. And you can deploy that capital in ways that contribute to humanity and to society. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics, Josh Making Bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Filber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Today's guest, super amazing. He's an American entrepreneur and author. He's the former co-founder and chief executive officer of Visalis, a multi-level marketing company. They were a subsidiary of the publicly traded company Blythe Inc., Ryan Blair is here, and he went from the streets to a successful entrepreneur. He has written a best-selling book. You're an incredibly successful businessman, and I've done very well as well. Both of us got here. We have the legend, Ryan Blair, in the house, man. Good to see you, brother. I feel like you're one of my biggest mentors from how much you share and how much you have a company, but you sold this company originally for almost $800 million. Ryan Blair, everyone knows, the best-selling author, the multi-millionaire, the guy that made $2 billion, started one of the most amazing companies. Give us the secrets to, by 19, starting his own business, by 30, having six multi-million dollar businesses. At the age of 21 years old, Ryan had already founded his first business called 24-7 Tech. And since then, he created and sold numerous other companies for hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of his career, you guys. In 2012, Ryan was named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and exited his company in a $792 million transaction. Blair now leads his new company, Alter Call, and is a committed father and philanthropist. Ryan, we salute you. You are an American success. Ryan Blair. 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 Blair. Entrepreneur Ryan Blair. You can say they actually went from gang member to millionaire. An entrepreneur Ryan Blair has lived with ups and downs. And Ryan, thanks again for being with us. Your book is titled Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain. We have a whole different mindset. Nothing to lose, yeah. everything yeah. to gain. Everyone to help achieve their dreams with his latest book. It's called From Rock Bottom to Rock Bottom. He is a book. Some people let the pain stop them. Yeah. Most of us let the pain drive us. Does that mean we're sick? <laughs> you continue to add value to people's lives, and then the more you do that for a long enough period of time, it starts to have a bit of a ripple effect. In 2011, he wrote a book titled Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain, How I Went from Gang Member to Multimillionaire Entrepreneur, which reached the New York Times bestseller list for hardcover business books, as well as he had another book in 2016, Rock Bottom to Rockstar, Lessons from the Business School of Hard Knocks. He was the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2012. And now he teaches entrepreneurs the principles he has used to build multiple companies without sacrificing his purpose. Build your business without sacrificing your purpose or spirituality through Alter Call. So I'm excited to welcome Ryan Blair to Making Bank. Thank you, Josh, for having me. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be able to share. 
For sure. Uh, so I threw out some cra- different stuff in, in the intro there, but we'll dive into that here in a minute. But um, kind of tell us where you are right now today. Like, what has been that path for you, that mindset that's got you to who you are and where you are in this 2023? Yeah, I, I think that like a lot of entrepreneurs, my first leg of the journey about 20 years into my journey as an entrepreneur was the external journey. You know, I wanted the fleet of cars, the private jet, the mansions, and, and I'm blessed that by the grace of God and, you know, some good luck and some good fortune, I was able to achieve a lot of the, the dream list. And after I achieved those dreams, though, I felt very empty and I realized that there was something missing. And I tried to, you know, get a bigger plane, and I did. And that wasn't happy on the bigger plane because so-and-so down the road has an even bigger plane. And then I tried to get more watches, but then I realized, like, all these watches, I don't even have the time to actually set them correctly. And so now I have these watches that aren't even telling the time right every time I put them on. And then I was like, okay, more art. And then I realized, well, oh, well, this guy's got a billion-dollar art collection, so my art collection is nothing. And I bought more houses. And so my emptiness just continued to grow and grow and go, grow. The more things that I bought and the more things that I owned, the more those things owned me. And so I came to the conclusion that there had to be a better way. And I started doing the internal game, you know, really connecting to myself, healing some things, looking at traumas, looking at triggers, looking at, you know, the challenges I had. And, and I made the decision that I was going to play an internal game as opposed to an external game. But I have to tell you that I would not have come to the conclusion that the internal game was much more powerful than the external had I not played a good external game. Mm. No, that and that's so true. And it's not and you didn't grow up kind of easy street, hey, you know, hit fall into a business and just and just have it all work out for you. Um, reading your books and everything. And so what I think one of the big things is in it, and I think it's pretty profound kind of what you talk about, kind of your journey and, and where you got, what you came from, I think is, you know, very significant because a lot of people aren't in that position. Like, oh, cool, you know, I, I, my family's great. They handed me a business and, and, you know, it flourished and I took off from there. So kind of give us a little bit of insight what where you got started at, I guess, to kick things off. Well, you know, I got started as an entrepreneur hustling paper routes. I had two of them and I'd have to get up at, I tell my son this all the time, I'd have to get up at like 5.30, fold the papers, ride my bike, you know, in the rain, uh, seven days a week. You know, I was, I was an entrepreneur. I had a paper route. And then I did lemonade stands. I was always trying to figure out a way to make money. Um, my dad was in the middle class, you know, he was an engineer in, in aerospace and my mom was a homemaker and both of them got addicted to drugs and alcohol respectively. You know, my mom was into alcohol, my dad into drugs, and both of them went through a very dark and difficult time. I was about 13 years old and I lost my dad at 14, um, meaning he disappeared. He didn't die. He just right. disappeared. But I still lost him. And so I, I didn't have a male role model in my life. I was really pissed off, really angry. And my sister's best friend and my first crush was murdered in a drive-by shooting. And so I wanted to retaliate. So I joined a gang and to retaliate her, you know, her the murder. And I uh, got caught up in a gang. And for people that don't understand what gangs are, gangs are just illegal forms of entrepreneurship. It has a hierarchy. There's management. Uh, we were in the, you know, import-export business. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were buying low and selling high basically. And I did all kinds of rackets in the gang. I stole computers, you know, tons of stuff. And, and so that, that was fertile ground for me to learn about this thing called entrepreneurship, but through the perspective of poverty and by the grace of God at 17 years old, I made a decision that I was going to change my life. I was facing uh, a jail sentence, four years for strong armed robbery. And I made the decision that, you know, I was going to change my life. And I made a grand barter with my, with the judge and uh, told him that if he gave me leniency, that he'd never see me in court again. And I honored that deal and uh, got a mentor later on and uh, then moved into legal entrepreneurship at about 19 years old. And I think that's, you know, pretty important. I mean, just those decisions that you made at that point 
to change your life because a lot of times people fall back into that same routine. It's not an easy transition knowing you're, you've been around it, you know, since 14, you know, three or four years. And it, yeah. it that's kind of what, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, the, the criminal element's interesting, you know, we're very money motivated in the criminal element. We, you know, we're on stop trying to figure out how to get paid and make money. Um, and there's a lot of genius in that element. What I always share with people is if you're capable of creating a big problem, you're capable of creating a big solution. Most people don't realize how powerful they truly are. And, you know, having lived in that environment, you know, been to jail in that environment, uh, having grown up in it, it was very difficult to, to get rid of it and to move beyond it. Uh, but I did because I always had a deep spiritual calling on my life. And because of that calling, I knew that, you know, I was making some decisions and potentially going to make some decisions that I'd regret for the rest of my life if I didn't make the decision to leave the gang environment. I did it. You know, I started making that decision at 17. And by 19 years old, I was, you know, starting my own business uh, and off to the races of, an, of a professional entrepreneur. Obviously, kind of coming from that gang entrepreneur mindset and everything, what did you kind of take from that to start to apply to really jumpstart your entrepreneur's, you know, growth? Well, one, I can read people very well. I can smell a person's intent and I can tell when a person's full of shit because, you know, in, in the streets, that's all you do all day long is you right. have to read people. You have to determine if this person is going to be trustworthy. They're going to rat on you. If they're going to come back, try to rob you, kill you, hurt your family, uh, get you arrested if they're an undercover cop. So you develop this intuition and these senses for people when you live in poverty. And I had that. So I, you know, had the ability to attract good people. I had the ability to stay clear from bad people. And I wasn't perfect at that, but I had, you know, a, a decent understanding and a decent intuition about people. And I knew you know, what a person was in an entrepreneurship, we call it a killer and gangs. The killer is a different definition, but I knew when a person was, you know, a, a strong individual with strong character and determination and, self-control and willpower. And I admired those people and I cultivated a character, you know, of that. And that was how I was able to surround myself with some pretty great people and execute at a pretty high level because, you know, my mindset was one built on strength as opposed to, uh, you know, one built on weakness, which a lot of people, you know, when you grow up really comfortable, it's very easy to cultivate a mindset and cultivate a character base that isn't very strong. And that's, you know, that's a, a pain that can be equal to growing up in an environment where you don't have much. An environment where you have too much can equally create a similar amount of pain. So kind of, you know, as people are listening to this and maybe they're kind of in that environment where they're like, oh, you know, you know I got things good and everything. What, what's kind of those three top things you say, okay, hey, these are some things you need to be doing right now to make sure you have that killer that strong mindset, that mindset that's going to help push you forward instead of just keep you comfortable? Yeah, that, the way that I would identify that is, you know, if you're in pain right now because you feel that you have untapped potential, which I have been in that position, even on the top of the entrepreneurial mountain with you know, tens of millions in the bank, hundreds of millions in profit a year and, you know, 600 plus million dollar company. But I was, I felt that there was a, there was a deep, part of me that was untapped and I didn't know how to tap into that. And the way that you tap into that is, you know, by doing everything you can to stimulate growth in your life. You have to humble yourself and become a student. You have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to surround yourself with people that are also, you know, on, on a, an aggressive growth path, plan and path. And you have to basically make your life about your growth. And the more that you grow, the more that you will tap into that untapped potential the less pain that you'll feel. And when you're growing, you're not comfortable. Like if you're really growing, right. it, I hate to tell this to you, but the life that I live is one that I grow so much that, you know, I might get a day of comfort a week, but the other six of them, I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm testing my, my limits. I'm pushing myself. I'm learning more about myself. I'm, I'm just so growing so fast that I am embracing and dancing with the challenges and I'm anything but comfortable in, in you know, the state that I'm in because 
I've organized my life and my practices and the people that I surround myself with to be as growth oriented as I possibly can. Hmm. As, and I think that's super important. And you've kind of mentioned it uh, over the last few minutes with a, as we were talking is um, surrounding yourself with people, mentorship. You said when you were young, you reached out and found a great mentor. What kind of impact did that do for you? And what were some of your big kind of takeaways early on and now um, that's helped you? Well, the first big you know, mentor that I had was just a wealthy person. He lived on the other side of the tracks. And, and I just saw that you know, the way he thought was different and the way he thought about money. Like he had 60 houses. Where I grew up, the idea of having owning a house, right? The teachers that taught me didn't own their own homes. The American dream is to one day make enough money to own your own home. And here's a man with 60 of them. And I was like, like the teachers that taught me didn't know anything about the American dream because if you can own 60 homes, like I couldn't get my head around that. It's like, you know, like I thought owning one home was the dream, but this guy's like, you, you know, he's like, you could own more than 60 if you want to. And you know, he was in the real estate business. He didn't have his, you know, these were income producing assets, not luxury. But nonetheless, like the juxtaposition between the idea of owning one home and 60 homes, I was like, everybody who ever taught me was full of it. They didn't know anything about the American dream. You know, I, I basically saw that this man had something that everybody else did not that I knew and, and was taught by. And I wanted to understand what that gap was because I knew that in a fight, I could beat him. Right. You know, like so as man to man, and this is the way I measured people at the time was like, if you can't beat me in a fight, then how are you beating me in the financial fight? And so when I realized that there was a gap there, then I started to close that gap. And the way I did that was I started buying vocabulary tapes. At this time, you had to go you know, to a bookstore and you had to buy you had to rent audio tapes because I couldn't afford to buy them myself. And I started buying vocabulary tapes on business acumen. I, I um, bought business books. I read the foundational personal growth books. I went to college, went to a community college at first, didn't even have my high school diploma yet, got my high school diploma at a community college, and then went to a four-year all in, in a business school. I basically obsessed about closing that gap. And, you know, and as I closed the gap between me and him, then I picked another mentor that had an even bigger gap, and this one was a billionaire. And then I said, okay, clearly this person has a gap between my last mentor. And so I started working on closing that gap and then another mentor and another mentor. And it's always about closing the gap, basically, and identifying what the gap is between where you are in life and what you want out of life. And kind of what was the gap that you saw? So, you know, initially working with a millionaire, now you're aligning yourself and getting mentorship from a billionaire. Kind of what was that gap? And then what were those takeaways that you applied to increase your overall mindset and wealth? Yeah, the, the big gap is people. Your ability to attract talent and your willingness to pay talent and surround yourself with talented people and develop those talented people is the difference between you know, a person worth 50 million and a person worth 50 billion. You mm. know, scaling is people. And that's it. It's nothing more, nothing less. You know, as, as you start to grow in your leadership, so will your ability to lead people to delegate to people and to scale. And so, you know, when I've met, and, and I would say that you have to have a great idea, obviously, but, you know, ideas are nearly a dime a dozen, but you have to have a great idea. And then you have to be able to scale your ability to attract and recruit talent and then lead those talent, organize those talent, the talented people. Um, and that's the big difference between people that, you know, have, you know, a $10 million company and a, you know, billion dollar company. And so with um, the whole process of uh, upgrading your mindset, aligning yourself with mentors and everything, I know now you talk about staying true to your purpose and your principles so you don't have that emptiness and, and to you know, feel, have that fulfillment. Give us a little bit more insight on that and then how you've been able to start to really align yourself in that direction. Yeah, as I, I've been mentored by some great entrepreneurs and some great people as a whole from coach John Wooden was a mentor of mine to the late founder of Microsoft, Paul Allen, uh, mm -hmm. founder of Quicken Loans, uh, Dan Gilbert, the uh, late founder of Zappos, Tony Shea, and a variety of others. And I don't say those names to name drop, but I'll just share with you what I extracted from each of them is their principles. So in my conversations, I would just think I, I'm, 
I'm a very complex and overthinker, but then I get to this point where I just try to dumb it down and say, okay, just give me one thing that I can focus on because I can't think about 10,000 things. And each of them had a series of principles that really struck me and resonated that I've adopted as my own. And then I've crafted a set of principles against those principles or with those principles rather that I then, you know, adhere to and, and, and you know, and, and, and execute on in my operation. And principles are like a piece of code in the operating system. And if you have a good principle, it upgrades the entire operating system. And they just give you a lens to look at life with and a set of, of conditions to which you take action or you don't take action. And I have decision, I have principles around my integrity. I have principles around my creativity, around you know my life, around my relationship with my son, around my business. And they're just guide rails. So that way I have a strong, robust operating system that can continue to scale as the pressure and responsibility of scaling and building a business and growing a family increases. And so that's what principles are. To each of the mentors that I've been, I've been so blessed to receive the wisdom from, it's just their wisdom is basically distilled into a set of principles based on whom they've been mentored by, the books that they've read and the experiences that they've had. And each of us just basically has a set of principles that you know we live by and then hopefully we transmute to the next generation. And so what, um, what's kind of like, if you take each of those categories, what's your top principle for each of those? Well, um, I'll give you one. So I can't take credit for all of them. I've learned everything that I've learned. I've learned generally from somebody else, or I've tried to even simplify what they've taught me and apply it in my own resonance. But like Dan Gilbert, founder of Quicken Loans, got a company that's got, you know, 20 plus thousand employees. He told me money doesn't lead, it follows. And when he said that to me, I'm looking at a man that owns, you know, 100 skyscrapers, multiple sports teams, considered one of the wealthiest men in the world, and a very solid guy. And his culture of his company is excellent. Like when you walk in those, those offices, the people you interact with, the environment that you're in, the work that they're doing is excellent. And I thought like the richest man in the world doesn't focus on money, or one of the richest men in the world, not the richest. He doesn't focus on money. I found that pattern as well in many of the other rich people that I've met. Um, is that, you know, they're doing it for something else. So, you know, uh, that would be a, a money principle. A management principle might be inspect what you expect. Mm-hmm. The principle that I live by that I crafted as a teacher is I learn what I want to teach and then I teach what I want to learn. And so when I wake up and I'm asking myself, what book do I want to dive into? I ask myself, what do I want to teach on? And it might be that I want to teach on, you know, the value of radical honesty, which is what I'm teaching on. Uh, tonight. And so I want to go learn everything that I can about radical honesty. I want to apply radical honesty in my team. And then I want to teach that. So I really learn it. But I have a number of different principles on the subject I've crafted and gathered about 150 uh, of these principles. Some of them have to do with the personal journey, for example. Like, for example, a principle that John Wooden gave me is uh, the best way to love your son is by loving his mother. Now, I'm in a relationship with my son's mother. I'm in a, a fam- I'm not in a relationship or a right. <laughs> romantic relationship with my son's mother. And so that principle reminds me that although I'm not romantically with her, that I should love her as deep as I possibly can because in doing so, I love my son. And that was a gift from John Wooden. I have countless principles like that that I've acquired and developed in order for me to teach my entrepreneurs that I serve and as well as the team and, and you know, and live a life that you know, is, is guided by uh, deep reverence for wisdom. I don't know I'm going to get this question, so I'm going to ask it now so I don't get a lot of the, the question. People are going to want to know, how did you make connections with these different type of mentors, I mean, that you've mentioned over the years? I've always had the belief that no human being is any uh, better than me or smarter than me. And so, you know, I, I never saw them as anything, you know, outside of my ability to call in. A lot of times we put these people on a pedestal and we don't, you know, realize that there's just a subtle difference, a slight difference, not even a big one. Now, the difference might be huge in the bank account, but not in a lot of variety of other uh, areas. So I had a belief that I was worthy of these connections, first and foremost. And then secondly, I was willing to have courage and reach out to the people. And those people that you know, had no interest in me, then I just realized, you know, well, that's their loss, not mine. Those people that, you know, expressed an interest, I did my best 
to try to cultivate a relationship with them. And I wasn't always good at it. There are some, you know, I reached out to Steve Jobs once upon a time and that didn't go very well. And, you know, and there's, there's some that didn't really work out so well. And then there's some that did. And I got refined in my approach each and every single time. And, and I also have a deep spiritual belief that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so if this person is my next teacher, I know that I'm going to receive a piece of feedback. I have to meet God on the field and have the courage to take action and request their mentorship. And then I know that God will do the rest if it's meant to be. So true. Once you've created that connection with them, what is usually kind of that top question you you would ask all the time? Uh, Is it the principle or is there something else you kind of initially ask to really start to understand where they come from or what, what you're looking to. Yeah. I, the best relationships I've created have been uh, built upon me being humble and asking for help. And I, I have a lot of people reach out for mentorship to me. And it's a necessary ingredient. Like I reach out to people and I say, I can't figure this out. And I'd love to you know ask you for help humbly. And then I always offer to reciprocate in any way that I can so they know that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not just a taker. I'm also a giver, but I'm very clear in my intention. I tell them I could use some help and then I ask them how I can reciprocate. And that tends to uh, resonate with the right type of people. You know, every one of us has a, an, an innate desire to leave behind our love and wisdom. And so knowing that people want to share it's just that people don't know how to approach them. And in fact, the more wealth and notoriety and fame that you have, the less people approach you. And the more, and, and I would say the less people approach you in a conscious way. Like people will approach you in a very unconscious way. And, and you know, you naturally have gatekeepers and guardrails for those people. But when people approach you in a conscious way that taps into your innate desire to share love and wisdom, you know, you're all for it. And so, you know, it's just a technique for how you open up the heart of a prospective mentor and then you connect to the person at the heart level as opposed to the head level. Because in the case of like a Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft, and, you know, he's no longer with us, but he was one of the world's richest men to ever exist. In fact, in the top hundred, he he had more wealth than the pharaohs and more wealth than Alexander the Great in comparison to GDP, GDP. Um, and so when you think about that, it's like, there's not much that I can offer this person. Certainly I can't offer them anything as it relates to money and wealth and nor would they have any interest. So what is it that I can offer them? And then knowing that and being willing to you know, give them something of value is part of the exchange. And in his particular case, I'll never forget the moment, you know, I invited him over to my house and, uh, he showed up. I was like, I can't believe it. You know, Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft, in my house, he could buy and sell this thing, you know, out of the change in his pocket. <laughs> you know, like right. his gas bill on his yacht is more than my entire net worth, right? And he showed up, he owned the Seahawks and the Portland Trailblazers, and he showed up to my house. And, you know, I'll never forget that moment. That's awesome. And that's, the, you know, super amazing that you've been able to reach out and find, you know, that type of help and encouragement and everything along your journey. And like you said, I think the biggest thing is taking it, having the courage to take that step and, you know, humble yourself, um, you know, to ask for it. Yeah. And being, and, and realizing rejection is just going to grow you. It's, it's, right. you know, it's, it's a part of the process. And so I kind of, I've fallen in love with this idea of doing the most humble thing that I think I, you know, that I can do. I'll just give you some simple examples. I don't drink anymore. And so I have a hard time dancing. Now, when I used to drink, I was a great dancer. But now that I don't drink. Everybody I is. Drink. Yeah, right? At least, at least according to vodka, I was a great dancer. Yeah. But now that I don't drink, I found myself not wanting to dance. And, and, and I was like, I want to overcome that. And so I hired uh, a mentor to teach me how to dance. And I now do dance class twice a week. And, you know, same with singing. At church, I'd lip sync. And at birthday parties, I lip sync. And I was like, I don't, I want to learn how to sing. And so I hired a mentor to teach me how to sing. And I've been doing that for three years. And so I'm always looking to to do the hardest thing that is the most humiliating and humbling thing. And by having that mindset, I, you know, I, I, I receive a tremendous amount of growth. 
That's awesome. What um, I know we got a little bit of time left. Um, what's something uh, that you're like, oh man, I hope Josh wanted to ask me about this, but he didn't ask me that question, or I just really want to share with everyone. Um, well, I was hoping he'd ask me about my dance moves, but we covered that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, your, your topic's about making bank. So if there's any questions on, you know, I think that that there's a process and I'll just, I'll kind of answer the question that I think that when you're spiritually inclined, a lot of people believe that money is mutually exclusive. And I think I'm here to tell you that by being spiritually focused, you can actually generate far more wealth because the money that you generate has a deeper meaning. And so you will call it in with more reverence. You will be a better steward of it, of it a better caretaker of it. And you can deploy that capital in ways that contribute to humanity and to society. And so for those people that are challenged with this idea of I'm spiritual and money seems to be mutually exclusive, I'm telling you that you can actually turn that narrative upside down and you can actually see yourself as a capital allocator and a person who's allocating money in such a way that it is spiritual. And so, you know, the questions that I always, you know, love, because there's, you know, it's really easy to understand how a secular entrepreneur would want to call in a bunch of money and it's sure. it's hard for a spiritual entrepreneur to get their head around the tactics and techniques on that subject so in having that then what kind of like mindset or what kind of thought pattern should we have so we are aligned that way well the the number one thing is is that you know there is a ton of money out there that needs a great home and a great steward and there are problems that need to be solved that only a purpose but only a person with deep purpose in their life will take up, you know, as you see, you know, Elon Musk is taking up a number of problems that are, yeah. that are, he's taking them up because of a deep purpose, not because he wants to make more money. In fact, Twitter has cost him like a hundred plus billion dollars, right? If not more, um, but he's taking it up because he feels that there's a purpose attached to it. So, you know, my, um, uh, my, my position is, is that there's you know, money needs a new home. And that there's plenty of greedy, egotistical people that are housing money right now. And we need to do everything that we can to reallocate money in society to people that are going to uh, distribute that money and solve problems with that money that are deeply meaningful to, you know, humanity that's going to overcome that, the, the number of conditions that we're all suffering through right now. No, that's great. What, uh, tell us real quick um, before we wrap up a little bit about Alter Call. I love what you're doing. And I think it's super important. I think people definitely need to take a look at. So if you can kind of give us a little overview on that. Yeah, Alter Call is three years old and we help entrepreneurs build and execute with purpose. And we help them exit. We've had a number of exits. We've had a number of entrepreneurs that have gone from, you know, small million dollar a year operation to tens of millions of dollars a year. And uh, as they do that, they're greater contributors to their team, to the marketplace, to their communities. And so basically, I've just taken what I've learned as an entrepreneur, and I've decided I want to work with entrepreneurs that have the greater good in mind and a higher calling in their life and a greater purpose in their life. And I mentor them with a group of 13 coaches. And uh, so far, we've attracted over 90,000 entrepreneurs into our program. And, wow. and then I mentor uh, those entrepreneurs that have the most promise on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Awesome. And where can people get more information about you? What do you have going on? Follow you and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's real easy. If you follow me on Instagram, I'm at real Ryan Blair. And if you hit me up on DM, we can have a conversation. And if you want to know about Alter Call, just go to A L T E R C A L L dot C O M. Awesome. Guys, and we have all the his links and everything here right below. So make sure you guys check him out. Uh, connect with Ryan. He's got tons of amazing content. Uh, his books are great. My Kids and I always listen to audio books on our drive to martial arts every day. So that was one that we listened to about a year or so ago. Uh, so it's uh, definitely, definitely great content and will help, uh, help you guys out overall. So Ryan, thank you again for your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, such an honor to be able to share your information and your content and mindsets and everything with our audience. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. And I appreciate all the hard work you're doing in the, in the world and the, the good that you're spreading through this podcast and all the other initiatives that you're up to. So it's an honor and a privilege to have this moment with you and your audience. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Uh, you were watching making bank get out and be extraordinary.